Thank you so much for coming out, everyone. It's, uh, it's really great to have you all here. Welcome. Uh, this is our fourth speaker series event. And uh, this is by far, I think, the biggest one. It's certainly the biggest room we've had and, and the most people here. Um, and we're really excited to have you all here, especially for all of you who uh, are suffering through busy season right now. So thank you for making the effort to get out here. Um, so just before we jump into the main event, uh, there's one thing that I want to bring up to everybody here, uh, a new initiative that Luminary is launching and that we're really excited about and I'm personally very passionate about because I was kind of the beta tester myself. So if you'll allow me, I'll just take a couple of minutes to tell my story of how I kind of got there and why we ended up developing what, what became our uh, CPA startup program and the new initiative that we're launching around it. So about six years ago, I decided that I didn't want to be an auditor anymore. I know that's a feeling none of you have had. Um, <laughs> but uh, so uh, when, I, when I decided that, I did what every good young auditor does. I quit my job and I enrolled in a master's program in counterterrorism. So <laughs> yes, that's, I'm, I'm not lying. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that brought me to Ottawa. And something really serendipitous, yeah, Ottawa. All right, some Ottawa reference over here, okay. Um, so I moved to Ottawa and something really serendipitous happened. I met a guy named Mark. Mark uh, is this brilliant engineer who had developed some really, really cool technology but, uh, or, or, and he decided to start a company around it. The problem was he really had no business background at all, no finance background and when you looked at his financial statements, you'd struggle to label them financial statements. Um, and so, you know, being a scrappy entrepreneur, what, what did Mark do? He found a solution to his problem because he didn't really want to have to do it himself. And that solution ended up being me. Um, so he came to me and he asked if I'd help out. So I started doing this on the side. And over the course of about three or four months, I developed some pitch ready uh, financial statements and projections for them. And you know, this was a really, really cool experience. First of all, I, I caught the startup bug. That's why I'm here today. Um, and second of all, I actually produced something that was really, really valuable for him. That three to four month period, it was really cool for me, but those projections were actually what we ended up raising about $2 million on over the next six months. Um, uh, once I joined the team, that part wasn't clear, I joined that company. Um, and so this was a real win-win. And so when I, uh, when I uh, look back on that, it was you know, really obviously a foundational experience for me. It changed my, my, my whole path entirely. Now fast forward to about a year ago, we had just launched Luminary, and a friend of mine who's a founder as well came to me and was essentially in the same position. Wanted uh, some help on the finance side and asked if we, could, if we could find somebody from Luminary. Despite the very, very small Luminary community we had at the time, uh, we put it out to the, to the community and about 80 CPAs applied to help this company out, which was really awesome. And very quickly they, they picked two people, and they started working together and it was a really great experience both for the CPAs and for the company. Um, so obviously the bell started going off in our head like maybe there's actually something here. And so we decided to try a pilot program and I think actually a lot of you here today were part of the pilot program. Maybe I'll actually ask, maybe this is risky, but who here is part of our CPA startup program right now? Okay, sweet. Got some good representation. All right. Um, <clears throat> so. We tried this with the Creative Destruction Lab. It's one of, one of Toronto's uh, top startup accelerators where we put out a job, a volunteer posting on Luminary. Within a week, we had over 400 people apply to it, which was nuts. We had to shut it down. We were not prepared to handle that kind of volume at all. Um, and myself, along with a couple of other people, some of whom are here today, I see Travis, I know Shabam's here somewhere, um, who are what I would consider venture CPAs, CPAs that are either VCs or in the startup space, you know, as finance managers or directors or ops people or whatever it may be. Um, all of us put together a really cool crash course to try to help these CPAs that we we're placing into startups just adapt their skill set to the startup environment. I mean, it's all the same basic concepts, it's just applying it within a new context. Um, so we put on that crash course, we ended up training over 100 CPAs and we started placing them in companies. This was about two or three months ago. And as of today, we've actually placed over 30 CPAs into different companies, which has been really, really awesome. The feedback has been amazing. We've been founders reaching out to us saying, I've never walked into a pitch 
you know, more comfortable in my financial, with my financials. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's just been a really great system on both sides. So we decided to take that and build something a lot bigger around it. And that's here what, uh, that's what I'm here to actually introduce to you. So uh, without further ado, uh, we are starting this new initiative that we call Thin In Tech. And hopefully that name is actually somewhat self-explanatory. We want to bring the finance world more deeply into the tech world because we think that there's a lot of benefit to be gained. More specifically, Fin and Tech's mission is to help early stage Canadian startups become massively successful by uh, uh, giving them access to the financial know-how that they often lack and certainly can't afford. So the way that we're gonna do that is, is, is doing three things essentially. We're going to um, uh, uh, inspire, train, and place CPAs into early stage companies. So from, from a practical perspective, what that means is number one, the inspire part is actually, you're about to do that in like 15 minutes when we get lean up here, because we'll knock all your socks off. But we have other events like this lined up um, from people who have you know, kind of gone in really interesting directions. The next one is the Federal Minister of Innovation, Navdeep Baines, who's a CPA. Um, we've got uh, John Ruffalo, the CEO of Omer's Ventures, who's a CPA. We've got Jonas Beeler, who's here today, who's the COO of Fan Exchange, really cool startup who's also a CPA. Um, so that's the inspire part. The train part is taking that crash course that we built and blow, ooh, am I doing okay here? Um, taking that crash course that we built and blowing it out into a much bigger um, multi-module kind of learning uh, session program. So it's all focused on taking the CPA skill set and applying it within the startup context. It's gonna cover every topic from like fundraising to the pitch to uh, tech concepts to really everything. Um, and the best part about it is that it's being developed and taught by really authoritative, awesome tech finance leaders, like, for example, Lean Lee, who's part of this in many ways, which is really awesome. Um, so these are all really practical courses. They're not university classes. This is like, you learn this stuff, you walk into a startup the next day and you apply it. Um, what we wanna do is build more of these venture-ready CPAs that can go in and add a ton of value. So the last pillar of, of this Fin and Tech program is the placement part. So we, we've been doing obviously like placing people full time into jobs at startups for a long time. And we wanna continue to do that and, and get more CPAs ready to be able to walk in day one and add a lot of value. But the key part of this obviously is the volunteer, place, oops, sorry, volunteer placement program. So before it was just Creative Destruction Lab startups, now we've made a bunch of partnerships with various organizations like Mars and Invest Ottawa, all the Ottawa people, um, Venture Labs, uh, Ryerson Futures, and, and many more to bring more startups into the pipeline. Um, so we're really, really excited about this. You know, from a CPA's perspective, what you're giving is 10 to 20 hours a month of your time for a three to four month time period, and really probably the best PD experience you'll, you'll ever have. I mean, it totally changed my life, but even if you decide that startups aren't the way that you want to go, or if you never really thought that that was something you wanted to do anyways, but you just wanted to learn about it, it's a really cool way to dip your toes in and actually add value and have fun. Um, you know, helping these young founders, they're not always young, I shouldn't say that, but helping, <laughs> helping, helping awesome startup founders build really cool, innovative stuff is really fun regardless. So, um, you know, the, the last thing I want to say on that is just that I, I really do believe that our designation needs to evolve in a certain sense. All of this stuff is stuff that we never learn when we're going through our CPA. And the reality is, is that so many more of our companies are innovative companies. And that's th thankful, you know, we're, we should all be thankful for that, that Canada has a great innovation ecosystem. And we can all add a lot more value to that ecosystem. So I'll, I'll kind of leave you on that topic with an anecdote about BlackBerry. We all know BlackBerry. Some guy named Mike Lazaridis came up with some cool technology and he started a company. And that company didn't really work so well for a couple of years until a young CPA named Jim Balsilli came and turned it into BlackBerry. It was really that mixture of brilliant engineer and hustling CPA that brought that thing together and made it what it was. And we just want to create more of those stories, more Blackberries, more Wealth Simples, more Influitives, uh, because it's great for Canada. So uh, yeah, if you are interested in any of that at all, sign up for Luminary. You can find all the information on your feed. And I will, uh, I will, I will end that little section of uh, of tonight. 
Now the, uh, the, the fun stuff, we get to introduce the people that actually made this, uh, this night possible. And the first one I want to introduce is, is particularly special because they're not just sponsoring this evening, they're actually sponsoring the entire Fin and Tech initiative. And they have really, really cool socks. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, if any of you haven't heard of Xero, it's a really, really neat cloud accounting software platform. They really have kind of created the startup platform when it comes to accounting. Um, you know, they're the big kind of um, Intuit competitor for everybody out there. And they obviously have a really cool different culture. See socks, exhibit A. Um, but, you know, Zero. as soon as we started talking to them, it became obvious that because they're in this space, they understood the problem and they were immediately passionate about solving it with us. So we're really, really happy to have Zero here today. I want to uh, ask Will uh, Buckley, who's the director of Zero Canada, to come up and just say a few words. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, Michael, for taking my whole pitch. So I don't actually know what to say anymore. Um, yeah, we're, we're really happy to be here. Um, as you can tell, I'm not from Canada, but um, I'm hoping to be a, a really good product of your immigration policy, which is um, treating me really well so far. Uh, so Zero has been around for 11 years globally. Uh, we are beautiful accounting software. We were born in the cloud. We have a really good user interface. Um, we really want to make it easy for, for small business customers, startups, to collaborate in real time with their advisors, whether they be bookkeepers, accountants, um, or, or anyone else in the financial advisory field. Um, you all should have a card on your, on your chairs. Some of you may have sat on the card. Um, so if you want to reach under. But this has a list of features. Um, we're, we're super pumped. We feel like we have a really good product here in the Canadian market. Um, we launched in January. Uh, we've got a team here in Toronto. We've got a team in, and a team in Vancouver. Um, so things are happening really quickly for us. We've actually got six jobs that are going to pop up on the Luminary website in the coming weeks. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, uh, feel free to apply. Um, but what we're really excited about is this initiative and what Michael um, is managing to do with Luminary and the FinnTech initiative. Um, me, myself, I'm a CPA in Australia. Uh, so I'm, I'm someone that definitely feels um, like the, the CPA profession can deliver a lot to, to each economy. Um, and what we've noticed here in Canada is that the CPA community has a tremendous voice, um, is highly knowledgeable in a lot of emerging and, and modern technologies. Uh, and what we're, what we're most excited about is bringing CPA's knowledge in Canada to connect and collaborate with startups in Canada as well. We've got 1.2 million customers globally. That's 1.2 million small businesses. We've done a whole bunch of research which suggests that when a small business starts without a CPA involved in the decision-making process, after five years, only 50% of those small businesses are still in business. If you can introduce a CPA into the conversation, and that CPA is still engaged with that business over that five-year period, the small business's chance of success goes up to 83%. Um, so we really do believe that CPAs can become truly trusted advisors, and that's why we're really excited to be sponsoring the FinnTech initiative, which um, Luminary and Michael are spearheading here in Canada. Um, the team's up the back, so if anyone has any questions uh, about the product, about how to get started, um, we're always happy to have a conversation, and um, most of us are ex-CPAs, so we, we love just talking anything to do with accounting. Um, so just want to say thank you very much to Michael and Luminary for, for letting us be part of this initiative, um, and we're really looking forward to, to working with, with everyone in the room. Thank you. And, and you're, you're not an ex-CPA. You're always a CPA. You're an ex-accountant. Just going to... Clear that up, but you know I think um, that's something. You know what Will brings up is is really the case. The fact that he actually started his own cloud accounting firm back in Australia, um, and and that came along with the really awesome accent. So you know a CPA, a cool company, and awesome accent. It was hard for us to look anywhere else. Um, so thank you, Zero and, and Will and, and the whole team for uh, for supporting us. Um, the uh, other sponsor for tonight's uh, event is in Fluidive. We're all in their wonderful office space. And actually, there's really special meaning behind this office space because our speaker this evening actually built it. Uh, Lean was the head of finance and operations at Influitive, and she actually put together this whole office. She was there for a number of years. You'll hear all about it. Um, but that's why it's a particularly cool place to have this event. It's, uh, yeah, it's just very meaningful. So thank you, Influitive, for, uh, for hosting us. 
Jeez, what was that? <laughs> yeah, fuck. Yeah. All right. So that was the longest intro we've had. I really uh, thank you all for your wonderful patience. But now to the main event. So it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Lean Lee, who I will ask to come up in just a moment. Or you can come up now, whatever. Either way. Um, <laughs> Lean, Lean is, I mean, essentially she's just the definition of the Canadian dream. Um, she grew up in a, uh, a rural Chinese village in northeast China, just uh, above the North Korean border. She moved to Canada when she was in her mid-20s, um, originally for school. But after school, she ended up getting a job at Eloqua, which was a SaaS startup, uh, founded by the founder of Influitive. And she worked there for a little bit before moving into several more traditional accounting roles at financial service companies, um, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about uh, during, the, during the chat. She ended up working her way up to controller before moving over to Influitive full time in 2012. Now, for the year and a half before that, she was actually helping build Influitive which is a really interesting piece of the story and we're gonna to get to it. Um, so once she came over to Influitive, she was the eighth employee. She helped grow this place from zero to 10 million in, in annual revenue. They raised over 50 million US uh, and they grew the company to over 150 employees. She was obviously a, a key mover in, in all of that. And then in 2016, she moved over to Wealthsimple to lead their finance department. And finally, uh, late last year, she was, uh, or she became the CFO of Wealthsimple. Now, for the past number of years, she's also been an advisor for uh, Toronto startup Presley, which was acquired last year by uh, Vision Critical, if anybody knows them. So, now, Lean, please come up and join me. Uh, we're all excited to hear your story. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Does it, does it work? You have to uh, play around. Is it working? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. All right. Cool. Um, so normally what we like to do is go a little bit chronological. So we'll start at the beginning and we'll kind of work our way through. Um, you grew up in a village called Baishan, uh, as I said, just above the North Korean border and obviously a very different set of circumstances. Uh, no glass windows, no real bathrooms, and I, in, in your own words, you never starved but you were never full. And obviously these are very different circumstances than a lot of us here, certainly myself. Um, so I mean, I wanted to start by just asking like, how do you think that your childhood shaped the person that you are today? When you look back on it now, you know, how, has, you know, how do you view it and how has it made you the person that you are? Um, wow, that's a long time ago. I have to really think about it. Um, so I think my childhood experience really gave me a different perspective on life. Um, I always say that, you know, uh, Life is not fair, so there's no point sitting on your couch and complain about it. Uh, do something with it. Um, so that's really the first thing. Second thing is really, I think I become much more independent and resourceful along the way. Um, you know, you have a different way to get resources uh, for the things that you can offer to other people. Um, give you an example, when I was young, I was really good students. I was really good with math. Like, this is true Chinese, is very good with math. Um, so I used to help my classmates to do their math homework and I figure, you know, if I'm really good at it, I'll get lots of people to try to get my help and then I can go to their house um, to tutor them during lunch hours or dinner time. So that's how I, you know, I was able to uh, get a lot more food than I was supposed to. So that's a really good thing and also to kind of let me to know how to teach other people in terms of learning or knowledge. Well, I mean, thank you for, for sharing that. I think, again, for a lot of us here, it's not actually a reality that we've ever experienced. So it, yeah, I mean. It's interesting because I just came back from China for my, uh, from vacation. So I had, um, I celebrated Chinese New Year for the first time after I left China with my family. We actually talk about, like, the things we did when we were kids. So that was kind of interesting. Um, but the one thing I want to say is I have a big family. So I came from a family of seven. So I'm the youngest girl of the five girls. My mom had five daughters. Uh, one thing is really gave me a perspective on how important uh, your family support is, right? So whenever um, I have challenge in my life, I uh, always go back to ask for feedback, opinion, and hopefully I can get guidance from them. I think that support system is very important um, around our lives. Uh, whenever you can get from your friends, family, and, and partners, that'll be really important as well. Well, I think that's something at least we can all hear uh, relate to ourselves. So, you know, thank you for, for sharing some of that. Um, 
you were lucky enough, you were uh, one of three out of five girls that uh, was able to go to university. And right out of university, you started your career at China Construction Bank, and you were a personal finance advisor. And I find this extremely ironic, since you are now the CFO of a company that is intending to make that job entirely obsolete. <laughs> so can you tell us just a little bit, like, how, was that experience helpful in your, in your current job? And like, what, what did you take away from it? One most important thing I take away from that experience is regardless how much money a client has, um, he or she always had anxiety talking about investment and the money in a very public setting. Um, so by saying that when I was working in China, it's like the bank is very open and you know you can talk. Like Chinese tend to be really loud. I can be really loud as well. So when you ask questions, you just try to scream and then the clients will like, talk about it. We go somewhere else, right? So I found like that's like most people are not comfortable talking about money, except in the public space um, settings. So I think with well simple, I'm not pitching well simple, but that's like one thing you asked, right? So we gave a safe space to our clients. If you want to talk to people, uh, we have somebody willing to help you. If you do not, then there's you know digital investment experience provided for you so you can feel safe and comfortable to talk about it. Also, we have our own blogs really to educate people on just money. Openly talk about it and to make sure you're comfortable with it because that's a really important part of everybody's life. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a, a pretty uh, strong insight because everybody, you know, the whole money discussion can be a very difficult one in a lot of different circumstances. So, especially when, um, you know, when you're kind of investing in something that's totally new as well. That must be a, an area of sensitivity that, that you guys obviously have to, have to address. Um, awesome, cool. Um, so uh, in your mid-20s, you came here as a, as a student originally. You moved to Halifax. Uh, you went to St. Mary's. You did your bachelor and MBA there. So I, I just need to ask, like, what was it? You know, Take us through kind of the mental journey where you're like, I'm going to pick up my life and move halfway across the world to Halifax of all places. Um, yeah. Um, a couple reasons why I wanted to come here. The very first one is I love travel. Um, so I'm just being transparent. At that time, my generation uh, with a Chinese passport is very hard to get a visa to any other countries. Mm -hmm. So it's not close to impossible um, to do that. That's for personal reason. Second, for the business reason, um, so at that time, the China is going through um, the change in terms of economic structure. So our bank uh, actually hired uh, somebody who came to abroad, uh, had MBA education, and came back to implement a different strategy um, that he learned from Western world, which is very interesting. And that's really motivated me to come here myself to learn. And then my original hope is to learn English, travel a lot, get my degree, get education, and go back to China to continue my career there. And then later on, I came to Halifax uh, for different reasons, primarily for you know, the tuition, the love there, and then the ability to learn English in a very small city. And I fell in love with Halifax and decided to stay. Yeah, I mean, it was that it. You just kind of got there, and you're like, this place is awesome. I'm going to stick around. Or, uh, you yeah, know, was that kind of the, the decision made? I think like life is all about you know making friends and making connect connections. So I went to Halifax all by myself. I was mid twenties. Um, I worked in China for five years before that, and I came here. I didn't speak a word of English, so it's really hard to communicate with other people. Thinking about you just have your own life, you control your destiny, and suddenly you came to a country you didn't know, even know how to order food, right? So Halifax become uh, the second home to me, and that. That attachment, that connection made me really want to stay there. And I was fortunate to make a few friends over there. And I really want to continue that friendship. So, and plus, I was single, so why not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair. That's great. Um, and you, you told me a really, really uh, uh, great story about when your mother came to visit you for the first time. She, uh, I mean, it sounds like, A, your mother was like a very influential figure in your life. She seems like, very funny and like really strong-willed and entrepreneurial spirited woman. So can you just tell us like she brought two, if I remember correctly, two suitcases full of seashells yeah. from China. Why did she do that? 
Uh, so my mom very artistic, and then she collects the seashells from the ocean, cleaning it up, and then she would match those pieces together to make artwork, right? So she would make peacocks out of it, and a Chinese teapot. Um, actually, I forgot. Uh, I actually had a piece on my uh, coffee table from home. This morning, I was going to bring it over to see it. So we make different kind of artwork from the seashell. And then when he was in Halifax, he was there. She was there for about two months, and then she made a little over two hundred dollars. Like she made, she made this artwork at home, and then she would just go to the local community and to sell them for a dollar or two. So that was really amazing. Like she didn't speak word English when she came, right? And then the second story is actually she made more friends in Halifax in two months than I was there for the year and a half. Like. <laughs> I was, it was a true story. I was invited, she was invited, while well, I was invited as well to, uh, by our neighbor to her cottage. And my mom was like, yeah, your neighbor invited us to her cottage this weekend. I was like, how? I didn't even know she had the cottage. I'm like, I don't know, which is, <laughs> like, she's an amazing woman. Yeah, I mean, it seems like she's kind of inspired a lot of where you've kind of taken your life and, and your career and everything. So that's, obviously, when you have five girls, it's great to have a, a strong woman at the kind of head of that family. Um, so in 2005, you got your first job in Canada, and that was at Eloqua, which, uh, uh, as I mentioned, that was founded by Mark Organ, who also founded Influitive, and that eventually led to your job here. But I wanted to ask, like, what was it like joining a tech startup as your first job in Canada? That's not exactly like probably the standard path that a lot of newcomers take. Uh, it was definitely a new path. Um, honestly speaking, I didn't have lots of choices. It's not like I graduated, I had like six offers I could pick. Um, I only had li limited time at that time to be in Canada. And then from one of my alumni from um, Halifax, um, he worked in the company. He introduced me to the company for accountant. Um, and I remember there was, I didn't even know what marketing software was and SaaS, and in the first month I got educated on all the product uh, that the company had, it was like, it was like just way off my head, I had no idea what was going on. But one thing I do learn from the entire experience is that um, how wonderful being an accountant in a company, uh, lots of people don't really understand, uh, at least I didn't understand before I walked in what was going on. But I think my position at that time gave me a opportunity to learn different parts of business and I can put different pieces together as a big picture. Because for accountant, you always see what's happening as a big picture. And also if you learn a little bit more, then you can see how to uh, kind of look forward to business. So that's one thing I really learned. The second piece, that's where I started learning about SaaS, right? Which at that time, was just starting. Right now, SaaS is just very hot. Yeah, I mean, at, at, at that time, it wasn't really like it is today, where every everybody and their and their brothers are starting startups. Sorry to everybody in here. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, I mean, one of the things that really struck me is that you know you worked at Eloqua for a year uh, in 2005, and then you ended up, I guess, you know, you stayed in touch with Mark over that entire period until 2010 when he started Influitive. Like, what do you think it was that you, uh, that, you know, that something happened in that time period when you were at Eloqua to, to obviously make a pretty strong impression on him? What, what was that? Um, I think it's like two things. My, personally, I think it's my work ethics. Um, second one is the, I was given the opportunity to prove myself um, that I'm capable outside accounting. Um, so the first one is work ethics. Um, I'm not saying everybody should do that, but I was single. I had no family, no friends in Toronto. Um, so I worked crazy hours every single day for a very long period of time um, because I was able to do that. Um, it's not recommended for everybody, but I think that's one thing is I was able to really learn the business, learn accounting in Canada, very, very quickly, and I was able to do a lot of things outside traditional accounting um, land. So that was one thing. Second thing is because I think I was working hard and I got really involved in different projects from other um, departments within the company, and I was given a really cool project called International Expansion, 
because of my background. Um, so I led the project as a, a team of four, and then Mark Organ was actually the sponsor of the project, so I was able to work with him directly. Think about it, I was like, I think my title was accountant, and I was able to work with the CEO of a 200 people company directly for a month and a half, having a one-on-one -on -one conversation and mentorship from him, right? So that was an amazing experience. I think at that time, I was able to actually make friends with him to really demonstrate that, you know what, I'm more than just an accountant, a traditional accountant. Uh, I think that made impression on him. So when I decided to move on from Alocor for whatever reason, he actually sat down with me for an hour and a half to really help me think it through my career path and what you need to do in the next few years in order to get where I want to be. And I kept that relationship um, and then, you know, um, I benefit from that. I really appreciate his mentorship. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that sounds like, A, a rare experience. It's not too often that you get that as just kind of a, a junior accountant on the team. But B, I, mean, I guess it takes a certain type of person like Mark to go and, and, and do that. So, you know, it's an opportunity. There's a, a luck piece and then there's a jumping on the opportunity piece. Yeah, um, I think that's why I like working in a smaller firms, especially in a startup environment, because you're able to actually meet different people from different parts of the business. You can actually make impact faster and you can make impression faster as well, right? You never know one of the one of the people you work with one day will give you that opportunity that you will not get from anywhere else. And you just need one opportunity to uh, to prove yourself. Yeah, and, and you definitely took a good, good uh, use of that opportunity. And we'll, we'll get to that uh, in a couple of minutes when we jump back to your time here at Influitive. Um, so for the next couple of years, you worked in, in some more traditional accounting jobs, Coventry Capital, HSBC, Corp Finance. Um, it was there that you became a controller. It's kind of your first real management experience. You know, what have you brought from that corporate world? Because I think a lot of us here have corporate experience I know a lot of CPAs are always thinking about, you know, should I get into the tech scene? What, is, what have you taken from that to your roles at Influitive and then at Wellsimple? Um, this is a fun topic. <laughs> I'm joking. It's, I think it's the internal controls and the processes that, you know, traditional corp corporations are really good at. And like, I'm serious, right? Like, so, like, when I get involved, like, when I work in a big bank like China Construction Bank in China, and also HSBC here, they're very established business, right? So, so they have a certain set of processes to do things. And to be honest, in order for a startup to scale, you actually need somebody who knows how to navigate those you know, existing processes, making sure that you have the proper documentation, making sure sometimes somebody is looking at internal control, look, look, look into the risk mitigation, making sure the business can scale, right? Like, that's what finance people are really good at. I think that's really a big part of it. Second thing is really kind of, I just figured out that, you know, what type of working environment I like to be uh, and why. And, uh, you know, I figured I like startup and small companies. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you know, it's funny because I think we all joke about at certain times, maybe some of the less sexy portions of our profession. But at the end of the day, that was my experience as well going into an early stage startup is like, there's no process at all. And we all kind of take for granted you know, being in somewhat bigger businesses that have things that are established, like we take that stuff for granted. We don't realize that you need somebody to be there. And with the, with the startup program in specific, nobody ever thinks like, oh, I'll help them with their cash process. But that's actually really important, especially cash and especially at a startup. So uh, no, that's, that's, that's great. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so we're, we're gonna take a, a short break to do something fun that we tried for the first time at our last event. We're going to do a lightning round. So what we're going to do, and Lean hasn't heard or seen any of these questions before. So um, what we're going to do is we're just like each of these questions should be like one word or one phrase answers. And we're just going to go pretty quickly through them. And just so that we can get to know Lean a little bit better as a person rather than just as a professional. So are you ready? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Number one, least favorite startup buzzword. Strategy. <laughs> I don't even know if that's startup. That might just be everything. Or strategize. <laughs> well, don't get me wrong. It's a lot of people start talking about that. <laughs> yeah, fair. Um, OK, number two. What's the most accurate accountant stereotype? Michael. 
<laughs> okay, that was a way better answer than I was expecting. <laughs> okay, um, so you, I mean, we, we know that you love traveling, so what's, the, what's your favorite place you've ever been? Hawaii. Hawaii. Okay, all right. Anywhere particular in Hawaii? Um, Maui. Oh, no, Big Island. Big Island? Yeah, I'm going to okay. die there. But. Awesome. So this one I'm very, very interested in knowing the answer to. Name a game that you would kick while simple CEO Mike Katchen's butt at. Uh, Chinese Mahjong. Okay, that might not be totally fair, but fine. Mahjong. <laughs> um, okay, so number five, the last one. I think this one's the most important for all of our, uh, uh, all of our next weeks ahead. What is the best authentic Chinese food in Toronto? Uh, Lee's Hot Pot. Lee's Hot Pot, where is that? Just uh, in Mississauga. Okay, somebody, somebody want to write this down? Got to circle back on that one. Uh, great, awesome, thank you. Uh, this is my house. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. I mean, we, so I if anybody's read anything about Lean in preparation for tonight's event, because I'm sure you all did what I did, um, Lean is a very big foodie. So we'll, uh, I, I don't think we're gonna cover that topic. But if you know you talk to her later this evening, you can ask her about that. Um, so let's jump back into the timeline of, of Lean's career. So in 2010, Mark started uh, Influitive, and uh, it wasn't until 2012 that you came on full time. So can you tell us just a little bit about your role in kind of forming the company on a part time basis, and and what what made you end up joining full time? Um, so I remember, so. 2010, Mark co-founded Influitive, and within a month, he called me and said, I need something to set up this accounting system, something to recommend this firm called Zero, but I had no idea what it is, and the person is giving me a, a demo on chart of accounts. Like, he's a marketing profession, right? It was like, okay, I can help you. Um, so I remember that Christmas, I went to his house and I set up uh, chart of accounts for his new company. That's where I started. Um, because over the number of years relationship, um, I know um, I all want to work for him, to learn from him for, in his next company. And then we started really kind of have agreement thinking about uh, what's my capacity and how I can help. So I was helped with the part-time capacity on the weekend just to have something to do. And in early 2012, um, the company was going out to the market to raise a seat round. And Mark at that time needs somebody full-time in house to run the process. Um, so he actually just called me and said, hey Lee, I need something to run the processes. Um, this is offer I would like you to consider. Um, so at that time, I think everything just uh, works uh, out and I decided to join um, for, just for the learning opportunity, right? It's exciting, I want to learn something. And I remember after I accept offer, uh, I, had, I had given a month notice of my existing company, my previous company. And Mark got me to work, and I went to Apple Store, got my own um, you know, computer for the first time. And the next day, I went to our, um, the, um, the lawyer's office on Bay Street um, to learn everything about seed investment and fundraising. Um, I remember he was asking, the, like, I learned a lot from our legal counsel at the time. He was asking, so he was like, any like, you know, experience with legal documentation? anything about it. I was like, I read my mortgage agreement two years ago because it can. He was like, oh my God, this is going to be a long meeting. But, you know, it was good. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, from what I understand, that was kind of your first real job at Influid. It was to go and help Mark raise a bunch of money. So what was, um, what was pitching for Influid in those early days like? I mean, I know that having a, a finance person in the equation adds a level of credibility to kind of some of the numbers behind it, but I mean, it was a really, really early stage thing at the time. So do you want to share just a little about that? Uh, don't get discouraged. I think at early stage with startup company, especially pre-seed, um, there's not a whole lot of financial information on the deck. There's no financial information at all. And then info was in advocate marketing space. So it's a new category. So there's like no benchmark at all, right? So the pitch is more about the vision, the team, and how big the opportunity could be in five to six years. I remember when we did the pitch, 
the night before Mark and I stay up late, we did a finance slide, like in terms of projection of the uh, ARR, is annual recurring revenue, and how big the company could be with the TAM. And then we went there, pitched to one of the VC who turn, turned out to be um, the Series A investor later on. And after that, they didn't even ask any question of the slides, that the only <laughs> slide I prepared. And afterwards, the partner was like, yeah, you're just pulling those numbers from thin air, right? There was really nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so which is very true, right? But one thing with the early stage startup is uh, cash management is one of the most important thing uh, in day-to-day -day operations. So I think for early finance professions, when you join an early startup company, you learn a lot from the pitching exercise because that's where you really understand the market, your clients, um, your vision, and then how you position your product because that's how you position to your investors. But second, internally, you add lots of value to actually manage cash, right? There are different ways to get around. And also, I think at that time, it was stressful because we had about 10 people. Think about, you know, you're responsible for 10 people's payroll and really making sure you understand where uh, you're going to spend money uh, was one biggest learning at the early stage of the startup that you grew it. Yeah, I mean, your, your experience is definitely mapped onto my own very much. So uh, that's, no, that's, that's great. And, you know, it really seems like you and Mark had a, had a really great relationship, kind of a, a give and take around somebody with the huge vision and then the other person pulling them back down to reality. And, and I think that that, um, that kind of um, combination is really, really effective, but it has to be underlined by a huge amount of trust and respect. Um, for, from the story that I told earlier, you know, Mark and I had that kind of a relationship. And it sounds like you had it there. And, and Mark really obviously had that level of trust and respect when he forced you to pitch on your own for the first time. <laughs> um, there's a great story about how Mark planned a pitch in Silicon Valley and in New York simultaneously to essentially just force you to go and do it on your own. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that and like what, what was the result? <laughs> well, we didn't get any money. <laughs> we didn't need it either. So, um, so at Info, the early stage, we did Series C and we did Series A within one year. After that, the company was very well funded um, and then I was given the opportunity to think about the next promotion uh, as one of the, um, the development point. Uh, I need to really kind of develop my public speaking um, skills and also to be able to pitch the business on my own. So that's one of the criteria that Mark and I, you know, come up together. But it's very hard to actually practice that, right, with very low risks. Like how are we going to say, I'm going to pitch 10 VCs with with low risk. So I didn't even know that. So Mark was like, hey, what's your strategy? We're thinking about it. What are you planning to do? I was like, I have no idea. Let me think about it. I think I have no idea how he came up with this idea. Within three days, Mark was, hey, you know what? Book your flight to San Francisco. I got you your speaking coach. I was like, why? He was like, also book your flight to San Francisco in March because I got your pitch event going on. I was like, what? So he was like, yeah, you know what? Like I double book myself, I have to be in Boston because of these reasons. Now you're going to San Francisco to pitch in this event. There's like 50 VCs. But he's like, don't worry, I got you coach. And the risk is very low because we don't really need money. And you should start with that. I was like, what? <laughs> so I was like, I'm, I, I tend to think I'm personally actually take the calculated risks. At that time I was like, I was really, it was the anxiety really got me. I couldn't sleep for a couple of days. And then I went to uh, talk to the coach in San Francisco, he was able to calm me down. I was like, I was really, really kind of worried. And he was really coming down to come up with the strategy and then the way to help me to kind of develop my pitch. And I came back feel better and the Mark and I actually work on the different pitches for me because one thing actually what I learned is doesn't really matter how bad, how good you are, you have to pitch your story using your own language, using your own messaging. That's really important because the other side, the people from another side of the table can tell whether you really mean it or not. You can't just remember other people's pitch because Mark and I have a very different 
perspective and it was very different. So that was kind of one thing I learned from that pitch as well. Um, and uh, it, it actually went really well, I would think. <laughs> it was on YouTube. Well, yeah, you, you said you live streamed it back to the Influitive office. I know. <laughs> yeah, let's just, let's just keep the, the pressure low. Let's keep the pressure low. Yeah. But um, like, when you get there, it's just like, I was like, okay, I'm just going to do it. And then uh, you know what? I think the most important thing is like, it's a very low risk. So it's like, we have lots of money in our bank account. <laughs> Well, and, and you know, I think that it actually, this, this really dovetails into a really um, important part of your story that, you know, I think everybody at this point knows that you're a very honest, genuine person, which is great because, you know, you're really honest about the challenges that you've had in the language category. English isn't your first language. And I think there's a lot of people here who either themselves or people that they know or that they're friends with that have that challenge. Like, can you speak just a little bit about it? and? what you think the key to kind of overcoming it is? Because, I mean, again, you're, you're that story of the person that came over in their mid-20s and now look at where you are. And, and so I think a lot of people will look, look to you as an inspiring model. Um, I'm always like concerned whenever I speak. Um, so I came to Canada when I was 25. Uh, I learned how to write and read English when I was in China, but like, you know, speaking wasn't a big thing uh, for my generation. So on the way from Hong Kong to Vancouver, um, I couldn't order food because I really didn't understand what uh, the flight attendant was talking about. So when I came, I just tried to really making friends with the Canadian students and the local people in Halifax to practice more. So I used to read newspapers very loud on the weekends, right? And I do different things. I volunteer in the senior house to hear them tell me stories. I can talk to them. So kind of different things. Once I go to the like, kind of professional environment, just really making sure that I have friends that I trust uh, at the workplace to tell me, to cor correct my English, to be honest, right? So I had a few friends at Infulive Whenever we went to the meeting or I did presentation, I always give them a heads up, say, hey, you know what, observe, listen to my um, language, listen to my pr presentation, give me candidate feedback after the fact so I can improve. I think that's Im very important to recognize that, you know, you have a shortcoming, like English is my second language. How do I address that in the business setting is very important. And be honest with myself, it's like, you know what, I would never be able to speak English the way you speak, that's fine. Um, but can I uh, express myself, really making sure I get my message crossed to the audience um, is more important than, you know, have a beautiful accent like Michael and Will. He's got the beautiful accent. But I mean, no, I, like, that's, to me, it's, it's actually really, really, um, I don't have a better word than inspiring because a VC pitch is like the most stressful kind of situation to put yourself in, especially from a language perspective? Practice. It's, uh, it's lots of practice. I found if I practice like a lot, I will be so much better. But if I practice a little, I'm just like not as good. Yeah, I mean, when, when we spoke earlier, you just told me like there's no shortcuts. You just got to work hard at it. And <laughs> I'm not sure that's true. Um, so uh, let's now jump over to uh, you know your your current role. I mean, I don't think it's any secret that Well Simple has been on a tear the past couple of years. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, you, you, what you guys have experienced is really awesome. So I I just have to ask, what what's it like being the CFO of like the hottest startup on the block? Uh, I I think the entire finance team from Well Simple actually is here. Are you guys here? Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys want to tell the story of the day at Well Simple? <laughs> you just we just finished around the performance review, so I can't remember that by December. Um, it was fun. Uh, one word is really fun. It's very exciting. Um, it's everything that I wanted before I joined Well Simple and maybe more. Um, so Well Simple is my third startup company in Toronto. Um, I think they're just like kind of this is a very similar stories. Like every single day you go in there, um, you're just doing different things. And they always say that in startup world, like you know, one year in startup companies you equivalent to like three years somewhere else. That learning perspective is great and also 
Um, one of the most important thing for me at this stage is whether I can learn from the people I work with. Um, because learning just like it's, it's, it's exciting, right? And at the end of the day, that's how you grow. And I'm able to work with a group of very, very smart and um, motivated people to do the best of work at Watson Post, and that's very important as well. And the finance team is definitely the best finance team I ever worked. I know I'm at Influitive, and I should not say that. <laughs> I have my previous team, but it's definitely the best finance team I ever worked. That's good to hear. It's yes. okay. I think I'm not as political, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of new members of the Influitive Finance team as well. So, um, one of the things that I think is is really serendipitous in terms of timing is that two days from now is International Women's Day, and I, I mean I think your career really should be celebrated as you know the the pinnacle of of what um, we'd all like to see more of. You've overcome more than one barrier to get where you are. And when we were talking about this, you said something really interesting, which was that the movement for equal rights for women um, that's going on right now has actually educated you on that topic. And I just kind of wanted to ask you what you meant by that. Um, so I grew up in China, like my household, like there's six females and one man, which is my dad. So he has definitely no say anything in the house. So I grew up in the, I grew up in an environment that, you know, uh, female has a very strong voice in, um, in the household. And also the working environment. Um, so in my generation, the Chinese government really, really encouraged female to get promoted, um, get advanced in their career. So they actually set different metrics in terms of um, how many female they can recruit, they should recruit, and how many females should be in the leadership position. So I was never aware uh, as much when I was in China until recently I came here and then start thinking about, hey, there's, for example, right, like let's be transparent, there's a pay difference between men and women. Um, they're just stats. Uh, and the less female get opportunity um, to advance their career to get promoted. And with all the kind of the movement and reading all the stats, just gave me a different perspective on how I was kind of blind in the past. I ignored the fact that, you know what, uh, we need more voice in the community to promote female, also to promote minority. I'm minority, um, you know, when I open my mouth, you know I'm not, I wasn't born in Canada. Um, I think I've been really lucky, given the opportunity uh, to be where I am. But I'm uh, looking at a lot of my friends who were smarter than me, uh, wasn't able to achieve what, whatever I think they should have um, because the language barrier, because of the cultural difference. So I want to just um, bring it up to say, you know what, um, really think about the people uh, in your workplace. Think about the differences they can bring, the different perspectives they can bring to the table. Give them the opportunity to talk to them to understand where they come from. And you never know what you learn from them. Well, that's that's great, and I think we all appreciate um, you know your thoughts on that. Um, I know we we do have to wrap up. We're actually coming up uh, pretty later than than we normally do, but that's just because you're super interesting, and I have like a, a, another like ten questions that I couldn't ask that I'm sad about. But um, you know, one thing that that you said to me when we were speaking a couple of days ago is that the most important skill set, or you feel that the most important skill set that got you where you are today was the ability to embrace the fact that you don't know everything. And you kind of touched on that when you were talking about, you know, your challenges around the language. But um, why, like, I mean, I agree, and, and nobody wants to hear why I agree, but I want to know, you know, why do you think that that's more important than all the other, all the other skill sets that you clearly have? I think we talked about while we were having this chat, is right now my new, like you know a lot of time people say you need to make mistakes, you have to embrace that. I think my new thing is like, I want to make new mistakes every single day so I can learn from it. For like, it's how I get there is very simple, right? You're, we're human being, like I'm not genius, I'm just a normal person. I can't know everything and I don't think I should know everything either. That's why we all work together to make the company the, you know, the best performing company, make the team best performing team. I want to actually learn from others. What 
scares me all the time is I don't know what I don't know. And that's a very scary part of it. And how to create a culture at the workplace to encourage your, your peers, uh, your, your, your bosses, or your subordinates to tell you what you don't know freely, um, I think would be a big challenge for any people, any person in the workspace. Um, and I'm trying to kind of think about the process to implement that while simple, especially within the finance team. Um, it's just like really interesting thing to see. And also, one thing I learned, like I didn't tell you this the story, like in terms of learnings, right? Like Google actually has been helped a lot in my uh, growth. Um, so I talked the story about my first day at Influitive, the our legal counsel was asking me my legal experience. So a few years later, uh, I was introduced, I was still at Influitive, I was introduced to a enterprise uh, client uh, who wants to talk to the legal counsel at Influitive. So I was introduced to, uh, to the other side, I say, hey, this is Lee, our in-house legal counsel from Influitive. We're talking after half an hour, and then the legal side of it from the other side say, hey, Lynn, where did you get your law degree? It was the University of Google. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a really wonderful ending, actually. Nice work. We, we, we are going to give Lean one opportunity, though. I think she's very much deserved it. So if you could just give us very quickly the reason why we should all be investing with Wellsimple. <laughs> How many people are Wellsimple's clients right now? Wow, there's lots of opportunity to, to convert the people who hasn't raised your hands. <laughs> <laughs> so I think at well simple in my own world, our goal and our vision is really to provide easy, accessible, affordable investment to everybody. Um, we are three and a half years old. Um, right now we have over 60,000 clients and manage over $2 billion uh, assets uh, in Canada, US, and UK. We have an amazing team, and we really think about our product from the users and client perspective, not from the traditional financial services company's perspective. So it's a very um, easy to use uh, platform for anybody who wants to give a try, right? It's, I would say it's kind of low risk because we really don't have a minimum uh, account balance requirement, and then the starting fee is very low as well. So give us a try to see whether you like it or not. If you like our platform and trust us, then put more money. If you don't trust us and don't like it, there's really no you know, loss. So Lean isn't very honest <laughs> or straightforward about what she's saying. Um, no, but honestly, Lean, it, it's really great having you here because I think everybody who's now uh, uh, heard what you have to say is just it's so obvious how genuine and kind of straightforward and honest you are about these things. And having somebody in, in your position, I think it's, it's really going to help a lot of younger people that are struggling with some of the same things, that see your story as a point of inspiration. So um, just a very quick round of applause before we go into uh, question and answer. Thank you. Um, so I, I've been a little worse at tracking our time. We normally like to make our events like one hour seated, no matter what, that's it. But we're gonna have to make just a small adjustment to say, I wanna give you guys at least a couple of questions in the audience. We'll do one or two questions and then we'll wrap up and everybody can hang out with each other or leave or do whatever you wanna do. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, why don't we get going on questions? Who's got a question for Lee? I know you mentioned uh, earlier that you know, okay. uh, oh, both of you, both of you, <laughs> both of you guys, you guys are both in the startup world. Uh, you guys, met, you mentioned earlier that everyone and their mother, uh, sorry, brothers, uh, has a startup. So, what do you look for when, as CPAs, you know, startups are coming up day and night? When you are looking to join a startup or a company, like, what are the things that you should look out for to find a great founder or like someone who you, I don't know, what are, you, what are the things as a CPA that you would look for that would determine if this is a company that I can transition my career to and stay with and grow with, or is it a company that's, you know, I'll, I'll spend quite a bit. Uh, 
Um, I think um, not just CPA, anybody who chooses to join a startup company, um, you really have to understand what you want to get out of the experience. Um, so for example, if you um, have a mortgage, have a family that needs stable cash flow uh, for a very long time, then you really have to think about you want to join a startup company ha who is very well funded for a while so you can support your family. Um, so that's kind of the foundation, but for me, I think the team is very important, not just the immediate team you work with, but also the CEO and the, the leadership team, because as I said, uh, a beauty of working for a startup company is you're able to work with the senior leaderships at a very, like, day, like on a daily basis. You want actually making sure you work with a group of people that can accelerate your career, your learnings, compared to um, a group of people that you don't really think you can get out of it. So that's kind of the people side of it. Uh, a lot of people say you join a startup, you really have to believe in the vision, the product. Um, I think that's very important for certain professions. Um, now I'm just being honest. It's not as important for CPAs. Like I'm like, you know, I'm, I was an accountant, right? Like I understand financial statements, I understand the product as far as long as I don't hate the product, I'm okay. Um, so that wasn't really the one thing that I was really um, evaluating on. But as I said, you know, in startup world, one year is equivalent to three years. So you want to find a startup that can give you that one year equivalent of five years, not one year. Because the earlier you are, the better you set yourself up, um, the faster you can get where you want the next step. So that's my personal. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to agree with everything that, that Lean's saying. I think ultimately it just comes down to the team. Before I got into the startup world, the number one thing that I read was make sure you get into bed with the right people. <clears throat> and that compensation at the earliest stages doesn't really matter because if you're a contributor and you, know, you are bringing value to the company, you will be compensated for that because the company won't want to lose you. So yeah. Um, so maybe we have time for just one more question. Oh, right behind. This is not more of a, a business question or anything, just more of a personal question, but what do you like to do or enjoy on your free time? Uh, I like gardening. Uh, so this is kind of a new thing I developed uh, after I moved to uh, Mississauga. Um, so I have like kind of a side garden. I do different things. So, so now you think it's a, this is finance talking. So every single year, I grow certain like the consistent like you know, the like herbs and tomatoes. I also keep an area that I try new things every year, and I will kind of record it down, like, you know, which ones are easy to grow, how hard it is. So I do that <laughs> every single year. I, it's very soothing, and also, uh, it's just easy. When you cook, you go outside, you get herbs, right? So that's like the one thing I really like to do. And some, awesome, well, well, thank you so much. Sorry we had to cut the, the questions a little bit shorter today. But um, now if everybody could give Lean the long round of applause. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. We, we have a small token of our gratitude for, for you coming out, including a Luminary t-shirt, of course. Lean, Lean told us that she couldn't find a well simple t-shirt for this afternoon, so now she can wear a Luminary t-shirt to the next event. Um, can I also get a free membership to your beta program? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> which startup out there wants Lean Lee helping them out? <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be awesome. We would definitely write a lot of articles about it. Um, so uh, we're just about to wrap up. I wanted to take just one minute because every time we do this, um, everybody keeps asking us how we're doing. And I think that that makes a lot of sense because CPAs are just generally really interested in business. So I will give the one minute luminary update. We are now up to over 8,200 CPAs uh, in our community. So yeah, great. Um, so this is across the country, but we are still very focused on the GTA in a lot of ways. And, and of course we want to expand that, but for the time being, uh, we actually represent just under a quarter of all the CPAs in the GTA, which is really cool. Um, we've placed 87 CPAs into diverse roles from you know, kind of entry level to, 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 to you know, very experienced. 
and across the spectrum in terms of types of companies and types of roles. Um, and then we've also placed a lot of people in various volunteer opportunities. Actually, there's a gentleman here today that just told me he's going to Africa to help out uh, with a company called Anza that uh, is, I mean, he could tell you all about it, but it, they do some really great work in, I believe, Tanzania. But, oh, anyways, I think it's Tanzania. Um, so uh, what, what we introduced today with Fin and Tech is really just a taste of where we're taking Luminary. Um, what we realize is that we're building Luminary to make CPAs' lives easier and to make your careers progress faster. And that means a whole lot of things. So we're gonna be releasing a number of different services that are uniquely designed for CPAs. We want your feedback, we need your feedback on it. That's how we're gonna make it better. Um, and uh, you know, we, we may have started with jobs, but I think we've built this into something much more. And we're really excited about that. So um, stay tuned for updates as you go. Of course, if you're looking to hire a CPA, please come to us. And uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, everybody.